Well, I think it was Mr. George Balanchine who said something about uh, hearing the dance and seeing the music. And I've always appreciated that sort of synesthetic idea that they're, uh, they're interlinked, they're not necessarily dependent, but they're certainly symbiotic. As far as I know, um, probably 99 point something percent of the people of the world dance to music, at least to rhythm, which is of course a kind of music, or music music. Singing and dancing have always gone together all over the world in every culture, except a little bit in the last 30 or 40 years in New York, uh, where that was, you know, dance and music were divorced. So I've always liked dancing to music. I've always loved music. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm such an aficionado of music that I'm sort of an expert. And I work with live music only. All of the classes here, all of my rehearsals here are with musicians playing music. We don't use recorded music at all. It's so wonderful to dance to the music and to be supported by the music. And it's not beat for beat, it's not like typing. Um, it's, it's very cleverly and artistically woven through the piece. And somehow you feel yourself swaying, even if, even if you're watching, even if it's a piece you know. And I have friends who come and have never liked dance before they see us. And that's a really wonderful. In the 80s, there was a, a great deal of dance was given over to what was essentially political theater. Mark uh, reverted to dance values, and he, uh, that is musical values, and he also uh, reverted to uh, early modern dance in the sense that uh, the work was overtly humanistic. My, all of my time with Mark as the best musical education that anyone could ever, ever have. Mark is amazing at um, reflecting the rhythms that are in the music, reflecting the melody, reflecting the tone, even if that's just a surprise, you know, if, if it's a tone that has changed, and Mark is very good at, at surprising our expectations of what is going to be to a certain piece of music. But the thing that I've seen over the last 12 years is a, uh, an obsessive, I mean that in a good way, obsessive devotion to to structure and a dedication to the way a certain piece of music is organized. When I start to make up a dance, I find a piece of music that I can bear to listen to and to study for a long period of time and, and stand to listen to hundreds and hundreds of times. Because you know, when you go to a show, very often you'll see and hear a piece once and you're satisfied. We, of course, have been working on it for weeks or months or years. Then, to turn it into a dance, I have my company assemble in the studio, I announce that I have no ideas, and then I start making up uh, material. I start making up steps that I think might fit somewhere in the dance. Everybody learns it, even if it's going to be a solo for somebody, all 20 people will learn it, and I'll adjust it from there. He approaches music in a way and chooses music that's so beautiful and it feels relevant, even if it's early music or Baroque, it feels current, it feels um, like you want to dance to it. I first heard the music of L'Allegro, Il Penseroso ed Il Moderato when I was living in Seattle. For me to hear this music for the first time was a revelation. It was a piece that I listened to over and over and decided because of the nature of the poetry and the setting of that poetry to music that it would make a wonderful evening uh, of dancing. So I was approached first by Boston Ballet. A couple years later, Gérard Mortier asked me to move to Brussels and asked what I would like to do. And my first answer, really, I think without hesitation, was L'Allegro, Il Penseroso ed Il Moderato. It 
if I'm doing a piece that's five minutes long or three hours long, I always work for music and I, I, I make stuff up. That's how it works. So to do the fact that this piece was much larger than anything I'd ever done was the whole point. That I had the musical forces and the theaters and the personnel and the time, most, most important, uh, to make up a piece of this size. Mark's evening length works, like any evening length work in the dance theater, uh, gives a more unified experience. It's so it's a longer space between the beginning and the end, and he can do more. Above all, he can ring more changes on an idea. <laughs> The subject of L'Allegro is the human community and how it copes with a certain range of emotions. But Mark's work has always been about humane values. It's, it's about how people treat one another, whether in fact we have a place in the world or we don't have, you know, individuals are, are they alone or is there such a thing as a community? Mark says, you know, a solo in my work is like four seconds. You know, it's very rare that you get to dance alone. And I think part of that is that he really likes working in groups. It's part of why it's called the Mark Mars Dance Group. You know, that, that, that idea of hierarchy, that there are some people who, who dan always dance by themselves, and then there's sort of a chorus, is, um, is not something he's that interested in. I think he really is interested in what it's like to, to work with a, a group of people, a community. In my earliest work, I really used direct quotations, citations from uh, dances of the world. Uh, folk dancing, we could call it, ethnic dances, national dances. I had a very strong uh, base, a very strong grounding in uh, sort of folk dances, not theater dances, folk dances of the Balkans in general, of Appalachia, of uh, Greece, contra dances, square dances, line dances and circle dances, that all of which I love. Figure dances, very difficult, complicated, or very super simple. It's one thing that, that allowed me to uh, be comfortable dancing. What happens is, in a lot of these things, you hold hands with people you know or don't know. It's dancing socially, it's not about what it looks like. So consequently, um, seeing folk dances in a proscenium theater is interesting for about 10 minutes and then it just becomes watching people dance in a circle, which is something I love to do. So, you know, within, within uh, certain restraints, I will present something like that. has everything in it that I love about Mark Morris's work. The imagination, the mystery, the wit, the beauty, and uh, the magic, uh, the musical acumen, and yet the spontaneity of the performance on top of that. I think in this case it's also beautifully costumed, beautifully set, and beautifully lighted. A L'Allegro feels like this beautifully pared down, like the essence of something. And at the end, lines of people just run towards you. And I have a friend who said, I almost screamed. It was so overwhelming. He felt as though he was going to drown with this joy running towards him, this mirth. And he, he was never the same, <laughs> sort of, you know. So. It was in my mind from when I was probably 14, 15 years old to choreograph uh, the Nutcracker. I heard the music for the first time. I heard it all the way through, including bits that are usually left out. I remember hearing a, a, a recording, a rec an actual record, listening to this with a friend of mine and deciding that I actually wanted someday to compose a dance to the entire score. So that's what I ended up doing.
magic of the Nutcracker was so, so overly familiar to me and to all my dancer friends that I wanted to go back to it and find out why it was so beautiful and so moving and uh, why it drives you crazy. If you hear it so much, it gets stuck in your head. So I wanted to purge myself of that uh, connotation of the music and go back. And that's why I went back to the E.T.A. Hoffman story and why I really included every note of music and tried to make uh, from the ground up a fresh production of this piece. When the company came back from Brussels and began to show us these extraordinary evening length works, usually with live music, like uh, L'Allegro and The Hard Nut and Dido and Aeneas, it, he was clearly, I mean, I was much more aware of something that had always been present, which is his ability to manipulate form, to, um, to take everything he had, which was an ability to make beautiful movement and to make raunchy, funny, vulgar movement and, um, and to make very delicately witty work and combine them in a piece of that scope and to, uh, to show you how beautifully he understood how to manipulate large groups of people. Um, and of course the hard nut had wonderful decor Believe it or not, my first notion of our chief collaborator was Edward Gorey, the very great illustrator and writer. I wanted something newer, someone who was more my generation, and so I ended up thinking long and hard about the beautiful and upsetting comic books and uh, graphic novels of Charles Burns. And he seemed to be the exact person to get sort of the the period of this, the zeitgeist, someone to design the overall production that would really suit my personality and my aesthetic. In The Hard Knot, I decided to cast a man in the part of Mrs. Stahlbaum. That's also a full, you know, English pantomime tradition. And it's not just a comedic thing, it's also a very poignant and sort of tragic idea that we, how men portray women or uh, women portray men, gives a certain uh, poignancy and delicacy uh, to the part, if that person is any good, that makes one look at one's own sex in another way. In a couple of the important dances, the Waltz of the Flowers and the Snowflakes, uh, we actually wanted the entire company uh, dressed alike and we wanted to use skirts. I wanted hard tutus for the snowflakes because of the hard shape, and I needed the soft shapes of tulip leaves for the dance of the flowers. And as Mark himself has said, if he, he wasn't really trying to make a transgender comment there. He said if he had had enough women to do it, chances are he would have done that. But I think there's a beautiful universality about that. <laughs> King Arthur, which is a semi-opera by Henry Purcell with a uh, text by, by John Dryden. It is a piece from the late 17th century and it was, it's sort of the structure of a musical comedy. There was a big, long, boring play with musical interludes. I have, for everyone's, uh, everyone should be thankful for me, I took away all of the talking. So it's these big musical numbers that don't really link, they're not, they're not related narratively. and. They're big dance and music and singing numbers about love and about patriotism a little bit in a wonderful way. And it's nominally about England, but I think it applies to everybody and everywhere. So there's a big dance component 
and there's seven vocal soloists who are on stage with my company and uh, then there's a chorus in the pit, the chorus and the orchestra in the pit and it is delightful. Dance being divorced from, uh, from opera seems strange and illogical to me since opera was always meant to include dancing and singing and oration and the visual arts and it was meant to be a full response to answer to everyone in the culture and that's what I like to have happen in my work. To me the point of working in opera is that it's the next circle of expansion from music to dancing to opera and I don't know what happens after that. I don't think there is anything. I think that's the culmination of the lyric arts. Mozart Dances actually was the working title for Mozart Dances. I, I didn't know what to call the evening of three pieces that I decided on, so we just called it, instead of calling it New Work, we called it Mozart Dances. A lot of people think that Mozart is difficult to choreograph, or, you know, people always misquote Balanchine saying that, you know, that uh, Mozart can't be done. It's, of course, nonsense. Mozart Dances, which is another evening long work, has no story, but it's very fascinating to see how all the values that matter to him uh, come into play there. And one is his sense of community. You always feel as if his dancers are a community on stage. They're not an ensemble necessarily performing for you. In Mozart dances in 11, which is the dance that opens the evening, uh, there's a wonderful freedom that I have being alone on that big stage. But then there's a big relief I have in the third movement when all my female colleagues come out and, uh, and they join me and then we dance together. Although the, the interesting thing about that dance is, to, for me, how even though I finally have that satisfaction of dancing with the group, I never really do feel a part of the group. Uh, and I, I think that's inherent in the choreography. And then at the very end, you know, I just stop and, and walk off by myself. And it, it kind of leaves you with a question in your head. And who, who is this woman and what is her relationship to these people? He's telling a story through movement, the kind of story that George Balanchine would tell when Balanchine said, you know, my dances aren't abstract, they're storyless. Music and dancing together tell a story and that's all the story you need. As soon as you see a human being, there's a story. And again, if there are two human beings, it's another story and it changes if they're facing each other or facing away. Or in that it's not a linear narrative or maybe not a narrative of any kind, that sometimes makes it compare with abstraction. Um, but I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that, except in other art forms, in, in literature or in painting or in poetry or um, probably filmmaking. That, that it, it's more easy to declare something abstract if it's not uh, representational. Howard Hodgkin, who I asked to design backdrops for this piece, is an old friend of mine, and he's uh, not just a genius, great, national living treasure painter, he's also a wonderfully kind and smart guy who has an insight into music that I admire tremendously. One of the things that influenced me were the three incredible backdrops of Howard Hodgkins. And I worked very hard to be inspired and to pay respect to them because they're beautiful paintings on themselves. But within them, you see things being opaque, and you see the transparency of a watercolor wash. And that actually was one of the great inspirations.
score for Romeo and Juliet as it stands, as we know it through uh, many ballets, is a huge sort of, to me, bloated affair of epic cinematic proportions. And it never really thrilled me, the music. So when I was offered access to the original um, manuscript from the archives, I was first of all curious and then skeptical and then delighted. I decided to start anew and to go back to the Shakespeare and to a lot of historical research, go back to Prokofiev and Ratlov's ideas about this piece and make up a dance from there that wasn't based on anyone else's choreography at all. Mark's Romeo and Juliet is, is uh, while it's uh, quite a departure from the tradition of Romeo and Juliet ballets, is very consistent with his other work um, in the sense that it's very much concerned with moral values and uh, it is also very much stresses the community, which is so often such an important force in Mark's work. Um, it's also consistent with Mark in that it's a little offbeat. The, no, it's not just a little offbeat, it's very offbeat. Um, Mark has said that he wouldn't have chosen to do it if it hadn't been for the trick ending, that is to say, the happy ending. Mark's treatment of emotion has always been, even when he was young, very young, has always been remarkably uh, profound and adult. Something that was important was dealing with a piece like Romeo and Juliet that was, um, the, the idea was that it was not, the orchestrations weren't as grand, but there should be something about the physical production that's not as full-blown or, not, not that I wanted to look unfinished, there needed to be something that was a little bit more human scale. At the very end of the piece, because Romeo and Juliet live, or they're, they're now living in a more perfect place. We end with really just darkness, the tiny lights, and and our memory of and of what it was like with the two of them in the path. And then, you, like you just hear their foot, their feet as they're sort of run, and the curtain comes down and on them, sort of in darkness and, and these little lights, which is uh, my, one of my favorite moments of the, of the piece. Mark's work is uh, is very diverse. Each dance is completely different from the next, and that makes my job as an artist, as a dancer, very interesting. You know, the way that you develop those as a dancer through the course of the evening is, is a rich experience, and that's something you don't get if you're doing shorter pieces. Um, and just to have the scale of those larger evening length works, of working with a full orchestra, working with singers, working with a chorus, is, um, is the most fulfilling part of this job. Mark Morris's work elicits a feeling, a joy, an emotion. It can make you cry. It can make you feel happy. You don't even know why. You feel like it's washing over you at times. I feel that, and I'm in it. There's no reason to make up a dance to, be, to a piece of music. You know, it's, it's indefensible. It's to watch and listen. That's all it's about. So the dancing and the backdrop and the lighting and the costumes and the people and the music and the audience, for that matter, there's no real defense of any of that, except it makes a, a good evening. <laughs>